These are the men and women of Beaver Valley, the bravest of the brave. They fought fearlessly for their country, their city, their community, and for the ideals we share as Americans. They served proudly in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf War, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Here now are their stories, their own experiences in their own words, the words of the heroes of Beaver Valley. 94-year-old Elwood City native Guy Prestia was drafted in 1942 and after training joined the 45th Infantry Division. We had a convoy of five ships and the one that I was on was called the USS Thomas Jefferson. And it took five of those to load up our division, counting all the soldiers and all supplies. The division landed in Oran, North Africa, where Allied forces had gained control. Here they began amphibious training for the Army's invasion of Sicily. Prestia acted as a BAR gunner. We were supposed to invade the island there probably two weeks, two or three weeks before we did, but they predicted a storm was going to come in. And they waited till the storm, thinking that, you know, nobody over there would be expecting anybody to go in and we wouldn't get much resistance or what our the strategy was, so they held us back. So finally, in, on uh, July the uh, 10th, we invaded uh, Sicily. We went in there and the storm was really bad. We had breakers out on the water that were 13 feet high. And going down those cargo nets to get in those small assault boats, the Higgins boats, they were uh, just hard to keep up against the big ship come, coming down there. Well, I remember one fella was a couple of rungs up ahead of me and uh, he let out a yell and he came down and hit my shoulder and went down between the assault boat and, and the big ship, but they never got him. They didn't stop to even look for anybody like that. It was just a lost cause. But here's what happened. They missed the beach on the boat that I was in, and they hit a big rock. Now, before we went in, they gave a command in there, everybody should fix bayonets. Everybody was crowded down, fix bayonets. You can't do that with a BAR. You have that bipod on there. So with the M1s and the O3s, they, they fixed bayonets. They were crouched down. So when we hit that big rock like that, what do you think happened? Some guys got stuck in the back with a bayonet from the guy behind them. And so this one guy that was from the Navy, he was smart. He kept gunning that boat up against the rock. He could have backed away from there and got out of, out of distance or something, but he backed into that rock. So one guy climbed out, handed his rifle like that, and we pulled each other out onto that boat. See? Now the guy that was a couple of men ahead of me, he got stabbed, he got hit pretty hard. So we pulled him up on the beach and he only lifted, lived for about 20 minutes. He had lost so much blood that he, then a lot of the other ones, some of the other ones got stabbed, you know, but n nothing that was life-threatening, but that was a crazy order that we had. Prestia and his fellow soldiers advanced into Italy, fighting both Italian and German troops. While in the Italian city of Anzio, Prestia's unit won the Presidential Unit Citation for holding German units within a thousand yards for around two weeks. One of the men Prestia was with in the battle had a serious injury occur. Uh, my, uh assistant gunner. His name was uh, Roy Zuber. So anyway, my uh, assistant gunner one morning got hit by a sniper and it hit his helmet. Hit the top. If he wasn't wearing a helmet at that time, that bullet would have gone over his head. But as it was, it hit the helmet and the helmet shattered and a bullet and a steel from the helmet ricocheted and come down across his face and knocked out one of his eyes. The nerves from his eyeball was dangling and his eyeball was going up and down like a yo-yo. And he just grabbed the eyeball and shoved it up in his head. Now we're inside this cave. There's a lot of artillery shelling going here. We couldn't get him out of the cave to take him down to the medics to 
get them in an ambulance, take them back to a hospital. He stayed in that cave. We wrapped him up with bent, with a rag or something, a shirt, ra wrapped it up with solanilamide powder that we had in our pouch. That was just to keep out infections. But it wasn't anything that deadened the pain. He was in pain there for three days. Three days he suffered in that in that cave. So we, we finally got him out after three days. The division proceeded to Rome, passing through Turin on the way. And we got to see uh, Mussolini and his uh, mistress and another man, I never found out his name. They were in Turin, they were hanging upside down. Uh, they had been killed by their own people. The partisans had killed them. I believe it was up around Lake Como. And the people there, when we passed them there, his own people there were uh, uh, throwing stones on the board. They were hanging upside down, and uh, they threw stones on them. Uh, they spit on them. They called them names and everything because uh, he had let the people down. Southern France was the next destination for the division where the fighting continued. So we were in southern France, and then we were in a lot of heavy battles in there. We got up against the Panzer divisions and also the uh, Mark VI, the Mark VI tanks. We were in uh, uh, St. Maxime, we were in St. Martin, and we were at time, and then we were getting to the winter line. We were up in the Vosges Mountains where it had been snowing so much. So, so in order to keep warm, we just dug under the snow and made our foxholes under the snow because we found out that you could keep warmer if you got rid of the wind. During the last phases of the war, the army finally entered Germany. The sadness and horror of war was about to reach its peak for Prestia and his fellow soldiers as they entered Dachau, a Nazi concentration camp. We had no idea. We didn't know what was there. So we went down there and here they had this building which was uh, added on to that that cow concentration camp was built in 1933 and was under the command of Heinrich Himmler and uh, it had more people than it was supposed to hold so they got a lot of the inmates to add on to it so instead of being like one building it was stretched out maybe four blocks long and they had one barracks after another. They had thousands of people in there, the ones that were still alive. So, but what we saw down there, we were not prepared for it. None of us. We had, a lot of our soldiers there had been overseas. Some were replacements, some were just over there a short while, but others were there for maybe two, two and a half years, something like that. And they were hardened soldiers. They had seen a lot. I mean, we had seen a lot of people getting killed. We had seen a lot of people getting wounded badly. We had seen so many things. But when we saw that, it was something we could not take. Certain things happen that I tell people about it. And I say that a lot of the soldiers, they just cried. They cried. You, you wouldn't see a soldier cry very much, you know, you did sometimes, but not very much. And then we saw some of them that vomited for what they saw there, and then we saw a lot of them like ourselves, and we did both. We just cried and we vomited, because we could not understand a person that can be that evil, that can do that to people. Because we saw like, uh, there were like over 2,000 bodies that were lying on flat cars. They had 39, tra 39 flat cars of a train, and there were bodies on there of men, women, and children, little kids on there. Some of them were naked, some of them were clad in just partially clad in clothing like with those blue and white stripes that they wore, uniforms that they had in, their, in the camp. They were nothing but really skin and bones. These people were so undernourished, and uh, they were just like walking dead people. So we had orders there that we were not allowed to give them any food because we had to turn them over to the medics who turned them over to the different hospitals to get them nourished back to health. Because if we gave them food, 
that would have killed them. They would have died from that because they were already almost starving to death. It was then, at that point in time, that we really found out why we were fighting in the war. We knew that, you know, Pearl Harbor was attacked and all that, but while we were in there, we didn't understand until we got into Dachau to see what was going on, what had been going on there.